morning. Well, happy Father's Day. I know that has already been extended to you, but I want to thank you fathers for being here and just hope you have a, a, a great, great, great day. Do you realize this morning in the United States, 19.7 million children woke up to a fatherless home? One in four children in the United States of America today will have no father present in their home. Now, it's easy for us to, to see the devastating effects that that has, and it does have on our culture. But I want to read some statistics because it's really staggering what happens when there's the absence of a father in the home. Those children are two times more likely to drop out of high school more likely to go to prison. One in five inmates in prison had a father who was in prison. More likely, obviously, to have behavioral problems in school and really for the majority of their life. Listen to this one. 279% more likely to carry um, guns and be actively involved in drug. More likely to abuse alcohol. Seven times more likely to get pregnant as teens. More likely to face neglect and abuse. And four times greater risk of growing up in poverty. So we, we see the statistic of physically 19.7 million children with no father in the home. But what I want to talk to you this morning is not necessarily for the physical absence of a father which we know that's there, but what about just the mental and spiritual absence or emotional absence of a dad in a home? Dad, you may be present physically in the home, but are you adding to the spiritual development of your children, to the emotional, to the mental development of your children? There are many fathers that may sleep in a home, but are you present for your children? Dad, you are the greatest influence in your child's life. As much as I love my mom and as much as I love you mothers, the influence of a dad is far greater than that of a mom. Why is that? Say, Pastor, how can you, you say that? Well, when, when God created the home unit and he created man, dad, woman, mom, he put dad as the leader of the home. Dad, it is our responsibility for the training of our children. It is our responsibility. Primarily, it's us. It, it, we should be the ones. Now, moms do a great job, and the reason some moms are, are doing more than others is there are many dads who have, just by their not being there for their children, have abdicated that responsibility over to the mom. But you can talk, and, and, and you can... can can do a lot of um, research and studies that have been done about the negative effects on a child's life when a dad is just not there for their children. This morning, I want to look at one of my favorite biblical characters. It's Joshua. This is kind of a, a precursor. This is kind of an introductory sermon if what, of, to what we're going to be doing in the fall. In the fall, we're going to go through the entire book of Joshua. But as I was studying through Joshua, getting ready for the fall, I thought this is just a message that dads need to hear. Because when you look at Joshua and you look at his life, I believe there are so many different redeeming qualities that we can find in Joshua's life that, men, we can, we can add to our lives. If you think about Joshua, if you go back to Numbers chapter 13 and 14, we, we see God has taken the nation of Israel, delivered them from Egyptian bondage. They crossed through the Red Sea, parted Pharaoh's chariots, armies, defeated. They make their way. They get to the Jordan. And Moses says, well, let's go and see the land that God has promised to us. So Moses goes and gets 12 spies, each representing the 12 tribes of, of Israel, and he sends them over to scout out what is in the land. 
So these 12 scouts, they go and they look at the land, and, and it is indeed exactly everything God said it was. God didn't lie. God said it was going to be the land that flows with milk and honey, and it was going to be a very prosperous land. So they come back, and they saw everything that God had told them except the armies that were over there, except the peoples that were there. And there was 10 of the men who came back, and, and they gave the report, the glory report of the land, but they started looking at the opposition. They began to say, now, wait a minute, there's some big dudes over there, and we, we just don't feel that we can conquer them. And so the majority gave what I call the negative report, that the, the land is what it is, but we don't see how we can take the land. But there was the minority report, Joshua um, party, which was Joshua and Caleb. Caleb would speak up and Caleb said, well, yes, they, they are big, but you need to understand we can defeat them. And so there were two that stood by themselves, Joshua and Caleb, and said, we can take the land. You, you know what they had that the others didn't have? They had vision. That's the first thing, dads, I want you to see about Joshua's life. That Joshua had vision. You need to lead with vision. You need to see what others cannot see. Those two men knew that they could conquer the land. Why? Because God said he was going to give it to them. That's, that's, all they, that's all they heard. When God said, I'm going to give it to you, they were trusting God. They had the vision. Let me ask you, dads, and I've asked this before, and I don't know how many of you really have, have thought about it uh, since then or, or even going to think about it this morning, but I need to ask the question, what is the vision that you have for your children? I, I didn't say for, for your life necessarily. That has something to do with it, but where would you want your children or grandchildren to be in 10 years? Say in 20 years. See, I think a lot of you, you're, you're, you're thinking about, yeah, I think I know where, you know, my children, I, I, I want to, you know, I want to get them through school, I want to get them educated, and I want to get them, keep them clothed, and I want to keep a roof over their head, and I want to do everything I can provide for them in, in that area, but, but that's about as far as you go with your, your, your vision. You, you need to understand that. Here's the thing. Your vision for your children, say in the next 10 years, so much of that vision is dictated on what you're going to do in the next 10 years. In a large part, I would say this, that, that how you live life in the next 10 years, in so many ways, is going to direct those children toward that vision. So what is that vision? What is the goal for your child's life? You know, we've been going through the book of Philippians, and Paul talked about that goal for his own life. He, he, he was pressing on toward that goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Paul understood that the supreme goal for his life was Christ's likeness. And he understood that the prize was going to be Christ. The prize was the inheritance of heaven. The prize was the glorification that one day he wasn't perfect, but one day he would be perfect. So his life in the now, the goal was to be more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. That was his goal. You know, that should be your goal, too. That should be the goal for your children. But see, here's the problem. For many of you dads, that's not the goal that you've set for your child. His or her Christ-likeness. Because here's the thing. There are four categories we can look at in the world. Wealth, beauty, power, and fame. So many of you, you've looked at that goal for your children, either wealth, beauty, power, or fame. You set that goal out there and said, this is what I want for my child. I want my child to be educated, as educated as he or she can be. I want them to, to, to graduate high school, and, and if, if willing, I want them to go to a technical school, or I want them to go to college, or I want them to go to the military, or I want them to get this great job when they come out of high school to make all of this money. And all of your efforts are going toward that. And listen, there's no nothing wrong with education but let me tell you something education is not sovereign so when you look at having a vision for your life just boil it down to this that your heart's desire for your children should be that they would have a heart for Christ and they would become more and more and more and more like Jesus 
And see, if that's the goal for your children, which ultimately is an extension of the goal for your life, then you're going to be modeling that before your children and they're going to see that and they're going to gravitate toward that goal. But if your goal is just towards success, and again, the world defines success, wealth, beauty, power, and fame. They can be as successful as they can be in the world's eyes and yet be a failure in the eyes of God. And Joshua understood this. See, see, Joshua and Caleb saw that God had given this promised land. That was their, the prize. And, and they knew that it was theirs for the taking. And they had enough vision to say that we can. But you know how the story goes. Did they listen to the majority, the ten, or the minority and the two? They listened to the majority. Isn't that just like the world to go with the majority? See, part of, listen, part of your leading, listen, Dad, leading in the culture that we live in is you're going to find yourself being with the minority more and more and more. Joshua understood that. God understood that. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't listen to what God said. They, they were disobedient. And so after the 40 years goes by, Moses is passed on. And I want you to look in Joshua chapter 1. The mantle is being passed from Moses to Joshua. Why did God choose Joshua? Well, Joshua was faithful. Joshua was a man of vision. Joshua never lost sight of what God said he would do in the beginning. God still can do. And what God's going to tell us and tell Joshua here in this first chapter is that the land and the promise has never changed. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. See, let me just stop here. The plans never changed. The visions never changed. The goal was the promised land. That, and by the way, what is our goal? The promised land. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Look at verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Underline that phrase. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7. Only be, underline it again, strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to... To all the law of Moses, my servant commanding you, do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Third time, underline it. Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The last phrase in verse number, in chapter number one, if you look at it, again, God says, be strong and courageous. Now listen, it doesn't take a biblical scholar to pay attention right here. If the Lord in one chapter says a phrase four different times, I believe God's trying to convey something to us. And he says, men, be strong and courageous. Why would God tell Joshua to be strong and courageous? Because he needed to lead with courage and he needed to be strong when others were going to be weak. Joshua had already experienced that. Can you imagine that for, for the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, he understood that they were there because there were men that were weak 
weak and would not trust God. And here God comes again. He's just stating what he had stated in the previous generation that God was going to provide this land and just trust me and I will give it to you, Joshua. But one thing you're going to have to do is be strong and be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. You see, it's easy, man, in the the world we live in not to be strong and courageous. God wants us to step up for our children. He wants us to, to be there for them. It's like Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, Here I stand. I can do no more. God wants us to stand for the truth. And there are going to be those times and there are going to be conversations that you're going to have with your children. You need to have those conversations. And you need to lead with great courage. And again, the world is going to go their way. The majority, that's where your children are going. And you're going to hear the conversations. And -and so-and-so's doing this and -and so-and-so's doing that. Be strong and courageous. And what we find here the really source of this strength for Joshua is that he meditated on the Word of God day and night. Man, if you're going to be strong and courageous, you need to be strong in the Word. You need to be strong in the truth. And then this courage takes over, and you're going to take the stands when everybody else and every other dad's going this direction. You're going to be the one that's going to stand, and you're going to be strong. And here's the thing. You need to understand that he walked with God. That strength only comes when we walk with God. But you you need to understand as, as he was walking in this strength and he was walking as a courageous man, he did not do it haphazardly. There was a plan. And God gave him this plan. Whenever Joshua eventually went into the promised land, he he cut the land in half, separating the north from the south. Then he went to the the to the um, north first and then he, he after he had uh, went to the south first and after he had conquered the south he then went to the northern territories and conquered the northern territories exactly the way God had described it and God wants you to have a plan that's why I'm asking you this morning men what is the vision for your children Don't just haphazardly go through life and not have this plan of what you can do personally to invest in your child's life. And you know, one of the ways I think you need to do that is that you need to start leading with spiritual markers. We find that if you look in Joshua chapter 4, we find Joshua leading with spiritual markers. You lead with markers because those markers help you remember what other people forget. In Joshua chapter 4, verse number 1, When all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according according to the number of tribes of the sons of Israel. Now look at verse 6. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the stones, to the sons of Israel forever. Why would God have him put those stones there? Because he understood that If those stones weren't there as a marker of remembrance, then the people would forget. And I love this because I believe God wants us to continue to put spiritual markers in our lives and that we can always point to them of what God is doing in our lives. Dad, here's one of the greatest things you can do in leading your family. You can constantly talk about what the Lord is doing in your midst. You can talk about what the Lord is doing in the life of your family. Your, your family. 
And, and, and so many things our children take for granted because we don't talk about these are blessings from God. Th these are things that God has given us. When God's doing something in somebody else's life or another family's life, talk about what God is doing there. Talk about the difficult things in life. And, you know, being a pastor, um, I'm exposed to a lot of different things that happens in the life of families. Unfortunately, death comes to families, and, and that's often a topic of conversation in, in our house when someone dies and what funeral I have to do. And we talk about the implications of that for them and the family and eternal implications. And so we, we talk about things all the time. And, and, and again, we're just saying this is what God is doing. You know, God's given us two spiritual markers within the church that we observe on a regular basis. One of those spiritual markers is baptism. Every time somebody is baptized, it's, it's almost a spiritual marker that we can look. And every time I baptize someone, my mind always goes back to when I was baptized. I can remember when my sister was baptized. I can remember when I baptized my two girls. And, and so many times as I'm standing in that baptistry and as I'm, I'm looking out of the congregation and I'm getting ready to baptize that individual, I see people in the congregation that I've baptized and my mind flows to, to you. And when I go home, I love the conversations we have at dinner on Sunday when we have baptism because the questions are asked of well, who are they, who's their mom or dad, or where are they from, or how did they end up at our church. And I love to give the testimony of, well, this individual got to our church because so-and-so invited them, and they started coming, and, and they ultimately gave their heart to Christ, and this person led them to the Lord, or I was able to talk to them. And, and just, man, it's a time of celebration just to talk about this is what God is doing. And, and whenever you see someone being baptized, there's a spiritual marker. Man, there's a great conversation piece. You, you know what we do? Many of you may not even know this, but when we do baptism, our children are in Celebration Stadium. We have the camera feed going to Celebration Stadium, so every time someone's baptized in Celebration Stadium, they see that. Well, what a great conversation piece when you get home. You know, the second spiritual marker is that of the Lord's Supper. It's a time of remembrance. When we gather around the Lord's table, it's a time for us to remember what Christ has done for us. And matter of fact, not only do we remember what Christ has done, it points us to the future of what God's going to do. Because Paul tells us that as long as we gather around that table, we proclaim his death until he comes again. So it's just a reminder that Christ not only came, lived, died, resurrected, but he's coming back to get us. What a great conversation piece. There's something in here, though, that's fascinating. And I had to think about this this week. When you look at verse number 6, he says, Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, what do these stones mean to you? Dad, let me ask you this. Have you created... A relationship with your children in such a way that they're asking about the stones of remembrance when's the last time dad granddad that your child or your grandchild has come to you and ask you spiritual questions dad when's the last time that child's come to you and said dad I, I don't know what to do here see I have two daughters God knew I needed daughters because if I had a son, I'd, I, it would not have been good probably. <laughs> I'd have been hard on him, but it's a little softer on, on the girls. But having two girls, I promise you there's conversations I've had with those two girls that have made me quite uncomfortable. There have been conversations that needed to be had about certain things in life. And, and there are questions that I'm asked about. Because there's been this relationship that's been fostered, this openness. And, and Dad, I'm not talking about them coming to say, Dad, help me with this geometry problem. I, I'm not talking about, hey, hey, Dad, show me how to throw the curveball. Hey, Dad, I need, I need help fixing my bicycle. Or, or, Dad, the arm fell off of my baby doll. Will you put that arm back on my baby doll? See, here's the thing. If your children are not asking you questions, then you're not leading with spiritual markers. 
you're not leading in the conversations about what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is going to do. And, 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 and remember this. This is important because we're going to see in, in just a little bit that Israel failed. Listen, they failed in remembering the crossing of the Red Sea, the wilderness experience, the crossing on dry ground of the Jordan. They failed to remember because the, pe- the kids, the children, stopped asking the questions. So, Dad, think about where we are in Joshua's life. Joshua was a man of vision. He could see what others could not see. Dad, can you see what others can't see? Joshua was a man who was a man of courage. And God, four different times, says, you're going to have to be strong and courageous. And then he led with those spiritual markers. He remembered what others ultimately forgot. You know, the most compelling question every Christian must ask is this. What am I doing today that will guarantee that the gospel impacts the next generation? We'll say that again. Dad, what are you doing today that will guarantee your children, the next generation, and the next generation will be impacted by the Lord Jesus Christ? The last thing as we see in Joshua's life is that he led with endurance. You want to talk about a man who led with endurance? Finish. Dad, listen. Finish when others give up. You need to finish when others are willing to call it quits. You need to continue on. Joshua, he could have, listen, 40 years earlier, he could have just said, okay, I'm done with this. They're not listening Why should I be faithful? But Joshua spent the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, but he was faithful. He believed in the promise of God. And because of, I believe, his belief and faith in what God said what he was going to do, God put him in charge. God used Joshua to go into the promised land, to conquer the promised land. And in chapters 23 and 24, we have two farewell addresses that Joshua gives to the nation. This is his parting words. This is a man who had endured. And this is the last thing he wanted the nation to know. Verse number 14, Joshua 24. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in the land that you are living. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's final words was to serve the Lord. Joshua knew that that generation and the previous generation and every generation after that, even to this generation, would be prone to idolatry, would be prone to leave the one true living God. And it's as if Joshua was putting a stake in the ground and his final stand for the Lord was this. You can choose who you're going to follow, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I want you to look over in verse number 29. And it came about after these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Now look at verse 31. And notice carefully what Joshua says here. Jo- the book of Joshua says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. At the end of the book of Joshua, we see that when Joshua gave that command, that Joshua and his generation, they were going to stand for the Lord. And they, they did remember what the Lord has done. 
How did they remember? Well, they experienced it, first of all. But I want you to look in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter number 2. In Judges chapter number 2, verse number 6. This same part of Joshua and the nation of Israel's history is is being retold, but there's a, there's a difference. There's something added here. I want you to pay attention. Again, Judges 2, 6. When Joshua had dismissed, again, this is after his farewell speeches, had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Now look at verse number 10. Here's what's different. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them. Now notice what it says. Who did not know the Lord nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Wow. One generation removed from Joshua did not know the Lord, nor the work that the Lord had done. There was a great failure of those fathers whose responsibility was to tell what the Lord has done the fathers whose responsibility was it for them to know who the Lord was it was the fathers an entire generation forgot forgot what the Lord had done and, and the Bible says did not even know him dad you need to wake up How many generations are we away from not knowing the Lord, nor the works that he has done? Why is it that year after year after year, Christianity in the United States of America is on the decline? Why is it now in this post-Christian culture we live in, why is it post-Christian? Because fathers have failed to tell of the wondrous works of God and have as their goal a relationship for G with Jesus for their children. The supreme goal for your child is for them to come to know who Jesus Christ is. God understood something when he gave the Shema. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, very familiar, but I'm going to read it. I want you to hear what God told them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and shall be frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God understood when he took them out of Egypt, when they were going into the promised land, he understood the most important thing you can do, Dad, is to teach them about the Lord. Because they were going into a strange, strange environment with people that were hostile toward them. And he understood that the only way the faith was going to be preserved it's for dads to pass it on to their children. Dad, I want, I want you to do something this morning. I don't know what your, your goal has been for your child. Granddad, I, I don't know what your goal ha is for your grandchildren. But according to God's word, the number one goal for our children is for them to know the works of the Lord in hopes that one day they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. When 
we look back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, what is that generation going to say about us? What is going to be the legacy that we've left for our children?